Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, June 26, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, the push to mandate vaccines, and ISIS pulls off multiple terror attacks around the globe. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, I stand against radical Islam. I'm sorry, I'm a radical. I stand against shooting police in the head. I'm a bad person. I stand against Al Qaeda. I'm not trending. Following a call by ISIS for war on infidels during Ramadan, three separate terror attacks took place today around the world. A Tuesday audio message attributed to Muhammad al-Adnani instructed Muslims to create calamity for the infidels, Shiites, and apostate Muslims during Ramadan. Uh, it also said to be keen to conquer in this holy month and to become exposed to martyrdom. Of course, this is a holy month, Ramadan. It's a month-long observance of fasting to commemorate the first revelation of the Quran to Muhammad. And here they're wanting to commemorate this holy month with bloodshed. Now, ISIS sympathizers took that message to heart, if you think they possibly have one. Uh, today in France, a man was beheaded during a suspected ISIS-inspired attack near Lyon. Uh, this was this morning. The culprits carrying, uh, they carried an Islamic state flag, and they scrawled Arabic writing on the victim's head that was left on a spike. The attackers also reportedly set off several small explosions as they drove a vehicle into a French gas company, with two other victims reportedly being injured. Now, the arrested suspect has been known to the security services since 2006, but they say they kind of lost track of, kind of lost track of the guy. So we're seeing that again and again and again. But you know, whatever NSA surveillance, we just need to continue funneling all of this money into it because it's it's so helpful. Now, the worst of today's attacks unfolded at a luxury resort in Tunisia where at least 27 people were killed after an attacker blew himself up at the Hotel Rio Imperial Marhaba in the city of Sousse. Gunmen also opened fire on guests of the hotel, killing several and leaving others face down in the sand near their lounge chairs. Now, authorities say that that death toll might rise. They're still identifying some of the victims and ISIS has also claimed responsibility for a deadly mosque attack in Kuwait. It was an apparent bomb blast that tore through a mosque in Kuwait's capital. It was during Friday prayer, so there were a lot of people here in this mosque. It killed 25 people and injured more than 200 worshipers. ISIS is claiming responsibility for what it's calling a suicide bombing. So this is it. I mean, they put out this Tuesday message, and here we're seeing the results of that. But you know what Obama says? It only happens here in America, so that's why we got to give up our guns. At some point, we as a country will have to reckon with the fact that this type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. So, of course, that was Obama once again exploiting a terrible attack to call for a stricter gun control, like he did once again today at what was supposed to be a eulogy for Reverend Clementa Pinckney, which was, uh, of course, one of the nine victims there slain in this Charlton, Charleston massacre. There again, he is calling for stricter gun control laws. Totally classy there, Obama. But the point is, the only thing that's going to protect us from these craven terror attacks, if we have some random ISIS supporters, is either going to launch one of these attacks here in America, is our Second Amendment. Just take a look at what happened in Garland, Texas. Now, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what the response is from the left of these uh, terror attacks that took place today, considering that they um, are constantly making apologies for Islamic extremism. But of course, what's all over the media today is the fact that the uh, Supreme Court made gay marriage the law of the land. So I think the left is going to be a little bit busy in celebrations uh, with this announcement to even consider these attacks. So it'll be kind of, you know, we, don't, we can look away with these is Islamic extremists, we won't have to discuss it. But considering the fact that Ramadan will not end until July 17th, uh, there has been warnings that we should expect some more attacks. Now, ISIS is, of course, already celebrating this bloodshed. They're heralding these killings as 
Bloody Friday. And this is taking place in discussions across secretive online forums and, of course, in social media. So they're celebrating. This is their holiday. One ISIS supporter wrote, this Friday is a holiday for the Muslims. So obviously it's certainly not all Muslims here that this person is, is talking about, but I mean, this is, they're kind of claiming Ramadan. They're claiming your holy month. They're claiming your Quran, your teachings. So obviously a, a lot of people need to be speaking out that, you know, not my Quran or start a hashtag or something because a factor to consider is that some people, they fail to grasp that ISIS is actually enjoying a lot more support amongst Muslims than is commonly believed. A poll conducted last year found that one in six French citizens have a favorable view of ISIS and a staggering 27% of French citizens between the ages of 18 and 24 sympathize with this terror group. So this is a poll conducted last year. And of course, now this year, that might be a little bit different considering the Charlie Hebdo attacks and now this latest beheading that took place in Lyon. And of course, for us here in the United States, they're re reporting that there are ISIS sympathizers here who have been caught trying to leave the country to go help join ISIS and people vowing to carry out attacks here, like the two uh, men who went to Garland, Texas, to attempt to carry out a terror attack there as well. And now, according to an FBI agent, the open border remains a huge problem for us here at the United States. Uh, this agent is saying that the border can be an attractive region for ISIS thanks in part to powerful drug lords. He says drug dealers have found a way to move money without it being followed, and they found a way to move people in and out, and they found a way to move product. And terrorist experts are saying the epidemic of unstable leadership in Mexico, combined with ruthless drug cartels, has created a vacuum. And that, of course, is something that our leadership has absolutely no plan for. They have no plan for ISIS, and they have... No plan for controlling the border. Dozens of people were killed today during three jihadist attacks in Kuwait, Tunisia and Lyon, France, where one victim was beheaded by terrorists wielding an ISIS flag. Islamic State militants also massacred over 100 civilians in the Syrian border town of Kobani. And what did we hear in the aftermath from world leaders? Islam is a religion of peace. No matter how many times you say that, it's not going to make it true. Islam is not a religion of peace. The Quran contains over 100 verses that call on Muslims to murder or go to war with non-believers. This is the source of the extremist ideology that leads to the kind of attacks we've seen today. Does that mean that most Muslims support violent jihadists? No but a significant minority do. And that's why we need a reformation of Islam as people like Ayan Hirsi Ali have called for. Look at France where today's beheading took place. One sixth of French citizens have a favorable view of ISIS. A staggering 27% of French citizens between the ages of 18 and 24 sympathize with ISIS, an Al Jazeera Arabic television poll, found that over 80% of its viewers supported ISIS attacks in Iraq and Syria. Other polls also show that frightening numbers of Muslims support terrorism, from the UK to Turkey to Egypt and beyond. A significant minority of Muslims clearly support ISIS. When are we going to acknowledge this fact? But don't expect Salon.com or any other leftist media outlet to blame all Muslims for today's bloodshed, despite the fact that they collectively impugned all white people for the actions of one lunatic in Charleston. It's not going to happen because it's not politically correct to acknowledge the fact that Islam is a violent belief system desperately in need of reformation. And this time, they can't even use Muhammad cartoons as an excuse. But remember what Obama said about Charleston. This type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. Well, actually, it's happened twice in France in the last six months alone. But the difference between the Garland attack in Texas and today's attack near Lyon is that the only victims in Garland were the terrorists who launched the attack. And why is that? responsible people using firearms. The very thing that the left wants to abolish 
in the wake of Charleston. And the difference between Dylan Roof and Islamic Jihadists is that there's no state-backed global ideology that explicitly advocates and supports violent white supremacists. But hey, you know, why didn't we just ban the ISIS flag? I mean, surely that would prevent extremists from murdering people, right? Are all Muslims to blame for today's attacks? Obviously not. But if you really want to lay the blame somewhere, how about Saudi Arabia, our supposed ally that funds and exports all the radical preachers to the West to spread the violent hatred of Wahhabism. How about the fact that these jihadists have been aided by our own government's foreign policy of arming and funding jihadists in the Middle East and North Africa to topple Gaddafi and Assad? When Islamic extremists kill people in France, we call them terrorists. When they do the same in Syria, we call them moderate rebels and send them weapons and money. And now it's confirmed from the very beginning the Pentagon knew this policy would lead to the rise of the Islamic State. The bottom line is this. Until we acknowledge that Islam is a violent belief system, until we stop supporting jihadists in the Middle East to overthrow sovereign governments, and until we recognize Saudi Arabia as the biggest exporter of terrorists in the world, many more innocent people, most of them Muslims, are going to die. Check out the other videos, subscribe to the channel. I'm Paul Joseph Watson for Infowars.com. The Pentagon is accusing Russia of playing with fire over nuclear threats toward NATO. That's right. This is coming from Robert Work, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense. He told in House Armed Services Subcommittee that Russia was trying to control the escalation of tensions by invoking the threat of nuclear weapons. He said anyone who thinks that they can control escalation through the use of nuclear weapons is literally playing with fire. Escalation is escalation, and nuclear use would be the ultimate escalation. So in other words, it's only the Pentagon and NATO that are allowed to escalate the tensions by putting up offensive posturing all around Russia, setting up all of their military weaponry and everything. That kind of a war is okay, but you know, that one's gonna be long and drawn out and bring in a lot of money for the military industrial complex. That's the only type of war escalation that's okayed by the Pentagon. Pentagon boss Ashton Carter has announced the United States will contribute weapons, aircraft, and forces, including commandos for NATO's rapid reaction force to defend against Russia from the east and violent extremists from the south according to the Associated Press. Carter did not specify who the extremists from the South are, but a recent NATO military exercise in Poland left little doubt. During the largest maneuver by NATO since the end of the Cold War, a rapid reaction force in Poland staged a mock raid in the fictional country of Botnia. Birdman is the name that maneuver planners have given the opponent in the Bothnian enemy camp. He must be retrieved from a wooden house in the middle of the military training grounds in the forest. Stationed in the nearby village of Alpha, are his followers, armed militiamen, who have begun to destabilize the region in southwestern Poland. The scene is recognizable as it is loosely based on the situation in eastern Ukraine. Except this time, a NATO member has been threatened by little green men. After all, the planners want to make the situation as lifelike as possible. A senior Pentagon official told the media Carter and the United States will urge NATO allies to dispose of the Cold War playbook in an effort to counter hybrid warfare, in short, the ongoing effort in eastern Ukraine to resist the coup government in Kiev. Here's a Financial Times of London story from yesterday, dealing with the fact that Washington is now fearing that Greece is going to go with Russia because NATO, the EU, and the West have been sucking Greece dry. The Atomic Energy Agency estimates that currently known stockpiles of nuclear weapons, if they were deployed, could destroy the planet, all life on the surface, bare minimum, more than 20 times. The numbers vary. But it is just mind-blowing to even imagine that our governments would be engaging in political 
and geopolitical activities that have taken us to a point that even most mainline analysts say is much more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. Yeah, do, you, do you think that you have, uh, that, that rich people have undue influence in politics in America? Yes, yes. But, but given the rules, you're not gonna back out. No, I, 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 I mean, the other rich people who have influence. <laughs> now it's even more cut and dry that the West via George Soros, who told Fareed Zarkaria on CNN a few months ago that he basically overthrew Ukraine and their elected government. He is now coming out and saying we're gonna have World War III. And he came out again last week and said he's serious. If there is conflict between China and a military ally of the United States, like Japan, then it is not an exaggeration to say that we are on the threshold of a third world war. Carter said the United States will contribute intelligence and surveillance capabilities, special operation forces, logistics, transport aircraft, and a range of weapons support that could include bombers, fighters, and ship-based missiles for the effort. The Pentagon has yet to reveal the number of troops that will participate in the battle against extremists. The announcement coincides with the defection of a one-time aide to the Ukrainian defense minister to the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic. Alexander Kolmietz took a wealth of classified intelligence information along with his family. The U.S. installed coup government in Kiev has suffered a number of humiliating defeats in eastern Ukraine as it attempts to assert its control over the area. The initial attempts of the Kiev regime and its CIA backers to subjugate East Ukraine by sheer military terror, relying on fascist militias and select units of the Ukraine army that it considered to be reliable, have failed. Popular opposition and covert Kremlin support from East Ukrainian forces has sufficed to defeat those units that Kiev could throw against the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, Alex Lanier wrote in February. John Bound for Infowars.com. Did you know that only six corporations control 90% of what millions of Americans see, hear, and read every single day? It's the illusion of choice. Think about it. The mainstream media is owned by only a handful of mega corporations with vested interests. But on the other hand, the internet is an interconnected network of billions of sources. So you can research information for yourself from multiple sources, or you can blindly accept what you hear or read in the mainstream media, never questioning what you are being told. This gives you a false sense of reality. I mean, do you actually know what you think you know? Or have you been programmed to accept someone else's version of events? Think about it. This is Darren McBreen, and I want you to break the matrix at Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. And listen to The Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on your mind. And don't tell me that I'm a weirdo because I'm upset about this. I'm just sick of dishonorable trash. Supreme Cobra Commander! Your failures! You think I'd sell my family out like you, dirtbag? I'm Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, yesterday we showed a video of a white woman holding her toddler at a park outside when a group of younger black women approach her. One of them hits the mother, punches her while she's holding her toddler. The toddler falls to the ground and then the mother is dragged out into a field where she was continuously punched in the head by a black woman. Yep, that's silence. Yep, no one's talking about it. But if it was a black mother holding her toddler and it was a white lady who walked over to that park bench and punched her in the face, guess what? You'd hear it all day, every day, on everything, NPR, CNN, Fox News, everywhere you would hear someone talking about it, calling this woman a bigot, a racist, demonizing her for the rest of her life. It would be called a hate crime. But because it is a black girl punching a white woman, yep, still nothing there. I'm not going to hear anything. It's called a knockout game. It's a game when it's a black person hitting a white person. But if it's a white person hitting a black person, then it is a hate crime. Welcome to America. That's lesson number one. It's interesting that this is called a game and not what it truly is, a hate crime. 
Now I'm going to show you quite a few videos of these knockout game incidents that have happened all over the world. In one instance, I'm going to show you right now, a man in England, in the UK, is walking. A black guy comes up to him, hits him. He falls from an elevated position. He's on a road where there's a curb. The man falls, hits his head, kills him. But it's a game. There's no outcry whatsoever. But if the tables had turned and that white man walked by a black guy and hit him and he fell to the ground and was killed, it'd be all over the news. That man would be demonized. He'd be thrown in jail for the rest of the life. The key would be taken and thrown away. Why? Because in this day and time, if you are white, you're automatically a bigot, a racist, and your ancestors were all slave owners, regardless of the fact that they were or weren't. This is what we have to do, though. Why is it not okay to talk about these things, but it's okay to talk about the other side of the spectrum? There is hate crimes of blacks on whites and the other way around, but we can't just focus on the ones that make us feel comfortable. It's okay to talk about white people attacking black people or these cops murdering young black men when exactly the same thing happens on the other side of the spectrum. White cops are killing white kids as well. It happens. But no one cares to talk about that. Everyone wants to throw up the race, the race card, and that's all you hear about every, every, every single day. Race this, race that, and all that does is create further racial tension. It makes white people feel like the black people don't like them. It makes the black people feel like the white people don't like them. And it starts this stereotype that circulates and it gets embedded in people's minds and the next generation comes along and the next generation comes along and it never stops. We're all the same. We're created equal. We have to treat each other as human beings because we all have the same needs and wants. We all need food. We all need money to provide for our family to get that food. We all want shelter. We all have to get jobs to provide shelter for ourselves and for our families. These are the basic needs that we all have. And we're all the same there. So we have to stop looking at one side of the thing and ignoring the other. So tell me what you think in the comments below. Was this a hate-filled crime or purely a game? I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. A prominent autism researcher and vaccine opponent was found dead floating in a river in North Carolina last week under what many are calling suspicious circumstances. A fisherman found the body of Dr. James Jeffrey Bradstreet, who was in the Rocky Broad River in Chimney Rock, North Carolina, last Friday afternoon. Bradstreet had a gunshot wound to the chest, which appeared to be self-inflicted, according to deputies. Now, how they would know that, I have no idea, because here you have a doctor who has access to any number of pharmaceuticals who could have ended his life in a more peaceful way, but instead he chooses to shoot himself in the chest and then toss himself in the river. So obviously a lot of people are already saying that this is suspicious. Um, the family says don't speculate, but they are investigating further. Now, here's why it's curious, because Dr. Bradstreet ran a private practice in Beaufort, Georgia, which focused on treating children with autism spectrum disorder, PPD, and related neurological and developmental disorders. Among the various remedies, uh, Dr. Bradstreet's wellness center carried out mercury toxicity treatments, believing the heavy metal to be a leading factor in the development of childhood autism. Of course, talking about mercury toxicity from vaccines. So in addition to treating patients, Bradstreet has also offered expert testimony in federal court on behalf of vaccine injured families. And he was also a founder and president of the International Child Development Resource Center which uh, Dr. Andrew Wakefield was a research director there. Now, the circumstances surrounding Bradstreet's death are made all the more curious by a recent multi-agency raid led by the FDA on his offices. And the FDA has yet to reveal why agents searched the office of the doctor, reportedly a former pastor who has been controversial for well over a decade. And I seriously doubt that we're going to get any information from the FDA about why they carried out that raid. And then this man was found dead floating in a river of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. 
Now today on The Alex Jones Show, David Knight spoke with Barbara Lowe Fisher. She is the president of the National Vaccine Information Center, and she was breaking down the dangers of vaccines and why you should be opposing legislation that is going to force you to take them. Joining us now is Barbara Lowe Fisher. She's president of the National Vaccine Information Center. It's a nonprofit charity she co-founded with parents of DPT vaccine injured children back in 1982. So for decades, 30 years, over 30 years, she's been leading a national grassroots movement for public information to institute vaccine safety reform. So we're going to talk to her about the science, the policy, the law, the ethics, the politics of vaccination. Of course, so you can get more information about her organizations at NVIC.org. That's National Vaccine Information Center. So that's NVIC.org or NVICadvocacy.org. Joining us now is Barbara Lowe Fisher. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. I would like to know, first of all, tell us all, because it, it's confusing when we try to follow these bills, when we try to follow the, uh, uh, the, the trade treaties that are working their way through the various ones. It's a very complicated process. Can you give us an overview, first of all, what's going on in California? And then let's talk about all these other laws that are being instituted across the country that would remove our informed consent, hold a gun to our heads to buy products for which the pharmaceutical companies have no product liability. Tell us first about California. Yes, well, as a lot of people know, in uh, January, we had a lot of publicity out of California, measles outbreaks associated with Disneyland. Uh, and what happened immediately with those, when those cases were reported, is that legislation started to be introduced in a number of states, including California, to remove or restrict the ability of Americans to take non-medical vaccine exemptions. That is, vaccines exemptions for religious, personal, philosophical, or conscientious beliefs. Uh, most of your followers probably know that we have vaccine laws in all the states. All states allow a medical exemption. All but two states, West Virginia and Mississippi, allow a religious exemption and about 17 states allow a personal, philosophical, or conscientious belief exemption. California is a state that has a personal belief exemption in, ad in addition to the medical exemption. What happened was that several years ago, uh, legislators introduced a bill, AB 2109, to restrict the personal belief exemption, require people to get a doctor's signature in order to take that exemption. Well, they, they passed that law, and there has been a reduction in the numbers of people who take the personal belief exemption in California. Right now, it's about 2.5% of all children attending California schools have a personal belief exemption. Uh, but after the Disneyland outbreak, measles outbreak, they decided to come in, these same sponsors decided to come in and, and introduce SB 277, which would completely remove the personal belief exemption for religious and conscientious beliefs. Where we stand right now, despite protests uh, for the last three months where thousands of Californians have come to the Sacramento State Capitol with their children, many of them with their children, to testify in uh, the, the several uh, hearings that have been held in the, the Senate and in the House, uh, as well as attend rallies that were pro have been protesting, public rallies protesting this bill. Uh, the Senate passed it. The Assembly has just voted 46 to 30 to pass it, and it will soon be on Governor Brown's desk. Mm. And it is an extremely oppressive bill. It will mean that California will join West Virginia and Mississippi as three states, if, it, if Governor Brown signs it, uh, that only allow a medical exemption. Now, why this is so important uh, to, to have everyone who's in California contact Governor Brown and express their opinion about what they think about this bill is because in this country now, almost no medical condition qualifies at, for a medical exemption under federal guidelines. 99.99% of children and adults do not qualify for a medical vaccine exemption under federal guidelines. Those federal guidelines are followed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, all the medical trade groups insist that their members follow the federal vaccine exemption guidelines. This means that almost no child will be qualified for a medical exemption. It means you have forced vaccination, 
with a violation of the human right to informed consent to medical risk taking, violation of parental rights to make medical decisions for their children. Uh, and what they're basically saying in California and in states that don't have a personal belief exemption is that you must abandon the human right to informed consent to medical risk taking in order to enjoy the civil right to an, a, a school education. Yes. They, they want to move everyone into a ghetto. They want to punish you by using the stick of denying you getting into a school, even a private school. They even had homeschool at one point. They've removed that, but they're going to come after the homeschoolers. This is just a temporary uh, bargaining chip. I think they did that because they know the homeschoolers are going to fight them the hardest. So they took them out thinking they wouldn't fight. But I watched that uh, testimony. I watched the people line up there, come to the microphone one at a time, give their names, a little bit about their background and say, I oppose this bill. Of course, they ignored uh, the wishes of all those people. Well, there were quite a few people there that identified themselves as homeschoolers. So they understand that they're next on the list. I, I think this is absolutely shameful. I think this is something that is worthy of Nazi Germany. When you're talking about exemptions. To me, that is only discussed because you're talking about something that's being mandated. We have a right to informed consent. That is our right as individuals. I read this uh, statement from you off of your website, uh, Barbara, earlier. This is, again, Barbara Lowe, co-founder of NVIC, the National Vaccine Information Center. This is at the top of your page. If the state can tag track down and force citizens against their will to be injected with biologicals of known and unknown toxicity today, there will be no limit on which individual freedoms the state can take away in the name of the greater good tomorrow. That is the essence of this. Wherever you come down on the science, and when I saw the uh, testimonies there, there were people who believed in the safety and the efficacy of vaccines, doctors and others who said this is a bad idea. They spoke up against taking away people's informed consent. That's exactly right. When you have a situation in this country uh, where we have always uh, cherished First Amendment rights, the right to freedom of thought, speech, conscience, religion, uh, and you, you say that the government has the right to tell doctors to inject you with whatever they want to inject you with in terms of these vaccines. And we have to remember that when the, the legal precedent was set in 1905 in Jacobson versus Massachusetts that affirmed the right of the states to mandate smallpox vaccine, there was only one vaccine. Today, the federal recommendations are 69 doses of 16 vaccines that children are supposed to get from day of birth to age 18 with 49 doses of 14 vaccines given by the age of six. Yes. This is a very different situation than we were talking about back even if, and I disagree with Jacobson. I think Jacobson is a tragically yes. flawed decision on moral grounds, on scientific grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you can take it, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts and Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1923 can use it to justify the forced sterilization of Carrie Buck in Virginia, yeah. because she, he judged her to be mentally defective, and he did, he said three generations of imbeciles are enough. Enough. If you can have a eugenics decision based on Jacobson versus Massachusetts that 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 said the state can uh, force vaccination, that is an ethically flawed decision. And we know that and this is where this is ultimately going, and where a lot of this is coming from, don't we, Barbara? Because. We look at informed consent. We look at what was said at the Nuremberg trials. They said, we are going to enshrine informed consent because if you hold to that principle, you can't have the kinds of things that happen in Auschwitz and elsewhere where they were, uh, Mingle and others were experimenting on people. They said they were doing it in the greater good. You know, we're going to do these horrific things in prisoner of war camps to people because we're going to find out about the human body. No, you don't experiment on people. This is not a problem of other countries either. We had the Tuskegee experiments, the injecting people, giving people syphilis without their consent, without their knowledge, telling them that they're going to get treatment, but then giving them placebos. That went on for decades against black people. We've had well, the CIA no doing that as well. Yes, go ahead. Right. I mean, there are very famous experiments on mentally retarded children, hepatitis B vaccine experiments on, hep uh, on mentally retarded children in New York. Uh, or was it Illinois? I can't remember which 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 uh, asylum it was. But you know, we we absolutely have to understand that protecting the human right to informed consent to medical risk taking, and as you said, the Nuremberg trials 
which uh, the, the tribunal at the doctor's trial issued the Nuremberg Code. There has been many examples, not only in this country, but other countries, where doctors have taken upon themselves, taken the authority, to use their authority to abuse human and civil rights and experiment on people uh, many times without them even knowing it. And, you know, when you look at the Nuremberg Code, you realize it did apply to the human experimentation. But after the Nuremberg Code was issued, it was really applied to all medical procedures. When you yes. go to a hospital, you see often on the walls, it says that you have, patients have rights and responsibilities. One of the rights is your right to refuse medical treatment or a drug that you think will harm you. Or if you're a parent, harm your child. That's called informed consent. And informed consent has been the standard, the gold standard in ethical practice of medicine since World War II. Here we are separating out vaccination from the informed consent principle and saying, oh, well, it doesn't apply to pharmaceutical products like vaccines, biological products that have an inherent ability to cause injury or death. And that risk can be greater for some people than other people for biological and genetic reasons. What you have is a state basically adopting a one-size-fits-all approach. And, you know, it's a de facto selection of the genetically vulnerable for sacrifice against their will. Yes. Because there are known and unknown genetic and biological high-risk factors. That's, that's really what it is. <laughs>